hear how loud my voice is. I think you can all hear me. Thank you, and also thank you for your patience. There's a lot of information to share at the Green Tech. So sometimes we are not directly into time. Uh, my name is uh, Yolanda Heistek. I'm the director of the Green Board, and also for the Green Tech, I'm the chairman of the international uh, jury. So this morning, uh, we were brought out the, of the, uh, the uh, Innovation and Concept uh, Awards. Um, so welcome at the technology stage and at the discussion about integrated crop management for healthy plants. Um, as I may tell you is that uh, resilient crops and robust co um, cultivation systems are very in the spotlight uh, these days. I hear about it every day. We want plants who are tough enough to uh, withstand diseases from contacts like fungi, uh, viruses or bacteria. Healthy plants. And more and more also uh, in consumers demand for environmentally friendly grown and resident free products. That is what the consumers are asking for. And this results in um, yeah, the question and also um, uh, the wishes about using less chemical crop protection. And we use already very less. So the use of the crop protection is under pressure. This is one of the main reasons that resilient crop systems are becoming increasingly important these days. And there is a lot of potential uh, to innovate, that was also in the awards, and the adaptive cultivation methods in horticulture. So, for example, much is known about natural solutions. I saw in a lot of booths about that. Natural mechanisms of action and the way they contribute to a resilient plant production. So this session, what we will uh, now listen to, will approach natural crop protection from different angles. And I'm only the moderator, and I can tell you a lot about it, but even more, the experts today can better give you more the introduction. So I'm very excited to introduce you to the panels. You see also the names over here. Johanna Bakmolenaar, researcher, plant health at Wageningen University. Welcome, Johanna. Guido Rosemond, product manager at Coppert. Welcome. And Dick van Alphen, manager international relations at Royer van Zanten. At the end of the presentation, I will... Yeah, uh, really like to come in contact uh, with you, so with a lot of questions and with the panel. But first, we start uh, with three presentations, so we have more information in what the experts think about these new systems. Um, Johanna, may I please first ask yeah. you to take the floor and tell us no more about uh, designing resilient cultivation systems. Please, Johanna. Yeah. Thank you. So, good afternoon, everyone. As said, I want to tell you something about the resilient cultivation systems and about the design of it. And then the question is, which building blocks can you combine to get to a really resilient uh, cultivation system? So if we talk about these cultivation systems that are resilient, what, what is the aim? Wh what do we want? I think then you want to design a cropping system in which high-risk pesticides are banned. And nowadays, even people are asking us, Maybe can we get a cropping system where we hardly use any pesticides? But at the other side, of course, you want that the grower still uh, is competitive, that it can uh, earn money. And then you should search for a different building blocks of green innovations, as we call it. And if you combine these building blocks, then we think you can get a real uh, resilient uh, cultivation system. It's not just doing one thing differently, and then you do better. No, you should combine things. Oh. Uh, so if you want to design a, a new uh, cropping system, you can do that for whatever crop you are interested in. Yeah, It can even be a crop in a greenhouse ground or a crop that is arable. But if you do it, you always have to concern certain things. And that's where we made this figure for. So first of all, you have to think about hygiene, so about being clean and staying clean. And it also has to do with all the water technology that we talked before. Uh, then the second thing is about the choice of your cultivar. We always tend to choose the cultivar that has the highest yield, of course. But um, if less pesticides come available, 
then it's very important to also look to, to, to the all the resistance that are there or the tolerances. And because we know it's not possible that you have a cultivar that is resistant to all the different types uh, of pests and diseases, it's also important to work on the strength of the plant itself. So to make the plant defend itself uh, against the, the pest or diseases that come in your greenhouse. And that is what we call induced defenses. And then the third thing, it's very logic. I think most people work already on it. It's about optimal growing conditions. But optimal uh, means it can be optimized. And you can think about very easy things, like um, how do you irrigate? Uh, there are still quite some uh, greenhouses in which, for example, uh, top hat irrigation uh, is used. But we also know that then that the differences in irrigation between plants is is quite big, so then uh, there I it's one of the things that can influence the whether a disease or a pest can come into your plant. And the last thing you should consider is the conditions around the plant. Maybe you can make conditions that block certain diseases or pests, or that stimulate your biologicals. And then you can think about natural enemies or about uh, biostimulants or things. You also can 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 make the environment better. And then, uh, yeah, if you grow in a greenhouse, I think it should be the standard that you also introduce your natural enemies. And then I give you want to give you some examples of things that we did as building blocks of a resilient cultivation system. So one of the things we worked on is uh, the establishment of natural enemies by banker plants and additional food. So natural enemies are insects that eat other insects, uh, pest insects. And these natural enemies, uh, you want to have them in your greenhouse always. But of course, your, uh, your pest is not always there. So how can you keep this natural enemy inside your greenhouse that if you introduce it once, it stays there until the end of your crop. So it's always available if the pests come in. Now, you can do that by using banker plants. These are plants that make the life of the natural enemy better. For example, it can give hiding space or it can give food by nectar or pollen, or it can give places where, uh, for example, certain natural enemies like to a lay eggs. Um, or you can uh, add additional food. So for example, you can introduce pollen in your greenhouse, uh, just only pollen without the plant, and they can eat it, and they can stay alive much longer and maybe even make a second generation. So in one of our experiments, we worked with Aureus levigatus, is one of the generalist predators. And we put a different types of um, banker plants in our greenhouse. So plants that don't give production, but they are only there because of the natural enemies. Uh, and then we had uh, three different types. One, Alisum has uh, nice flowers that have nectar. Sedum is very soft. You can very easily lay eggs in it. And Tagetus is a plant also. It has pollen um, and, and it gives uh, hiding places. And then we see that this... Um, this predator over time really increases in the greenhouse. So it means that there are new generations and um, these new generations again get a new generation. So it's really established in your greenhouse. Uh, uh, and if we didn't put this uh, banker plants, then it could not establish in this greenhouse. The second example is about uh, powdery mildew. Um, we had a trial in which we used a different physical method methods to fight the powdery mildew. Uh, these were two types. One was using UVC. It's an, uh, a light that can kill spores. And uh, mildew spores are a lot in the, in the air, and it can kill the spores. And the other thing was, uh, yeah, it's called beregening here. It means that we, from top, uh, made the plants wet. And the spores of powdery mildew, they cannot stay very long in water. Then they cannot handle the atmospheric pressure and they will more or less explode, so they will die. Uh, and we see that, especially the UVC, over time, it's the blue line. It um, makes the powdery mildew uh, stay low for a very long time, although th the rest of the greenhouse, there was even an untreated control, there was a lot of powdery mildew. And also, if you then look to the production, in this case, it was strawberry, uh, then you see that, uh, in that's the second graph, that the good fruits, so that is the light blue and the gr orange, they are higher. And especially the fruits with the mildew, it's the dark blue, I it's hardly there. 
A third, uh, third example is uh, about induced defenses. In our system, we treated the plants each three weeks with an elicitor that makes the plants more resilient to uh, insects, in this case, uh, trips. And then we did a test each three weeks whether we saw differences in how easily the trips could eat a plant. Uh, and then if you compare the elicitor, the in this case, methyl jesmonate with the control, uh, then you see that the yellow bar is always lower than the gray bar. And yeah, we see also that the gray bar varies over time, and this has to do with the status of your plant. N your plant is not as susceptible <laughs> each time of the, of the crop. Um, but it shows that you can induce the defenses, but also you can induce them for a longer time. It's not only at the really end we couldn't see any more this uh, difference. And the last example is about uh, uh, resilience by design, because we had a project in Strawberry uh, where the Ministry of uh, Agriculture asked us to uh, design a resilient cultivation system for 2030. And then we said the design is very important. So uh, strawberry normally is grown by cuttings, but we said if we can s start by seed, then we can really start clean. So it's on the hy hygiene part. And then, of course, we should try to stay clean. Um, and then we said also the propagation, so the part of the plant nursery should maybe come from outside to inside, because if you do it inside, then of course disinfection is possible, so you can start really clean. You can put your natural enemies from the first day onwards, and you can really optimize your climate, for example, to avoid uh, botrytis or other diseases, also powdery mildew, maybe you can influence a little bit. So these this three things, it's really something about the design of your uh, cultivation system. So you, you, you change something and it has impact on m multiple things in, in the cultivation system. And together, hopefully, you can get a better um, system. So in short, uh, we think it's really possible to cultivate less, uh, without uh, high-risk pesticides. And you sh really should think about the design of your cultivation system. So it's really, at the beginning, it's hard because it's not changing one thing. Um, and then you first should think about how to prevent diseases and pests to come in, and then also make a strategy how to fight it if they come in. That was in short. Thank you, Yo uh, okay. Johanna, for no, this, yeah. uh, for this in uh, <laughs> We have time for one question in the discussion yeah. we do after all the three presentations. Is there one question from the audience to make something that Johanna told uh, to be clear? Then we save it to the end. I don't see. So save it to the end, and then we go into um, yeah. contact with each other. G uh, Guido, please. Uh, I want to like you to invite for your presentation. Um, can you tell us something more about the possible uh, biological alternatives for chemical production in IPM systems? And I do not know if everybody here knows IPM, so maybe to start with that. Thank you very much. <coughs> um, well, maybe for the people who don't know IPM, it stands for Integrated Pest Management. So essentially it's the system where we first look to the natural solutions in order to control pests and diseases. And then in the second phase, we go for correction tools, either biologicals. And in the last phase, we go for chemical control. Thank you. Um, my name is Guy de Rosemond, and, let, and I want to uh, zoom in on how biological insecticides can help you as a grower to um, build really those IPMs, or integrated pest management systems, uh, in my presentation. Let me first introduce myself uh, and where I work. So I work at Coppert. Probably most of you know Coppert, but Coppert, uh, Coppert is a provider of uh, natural uh, solutions like beneficial insects, pollinators, um, and also biological plant protection products. And we do that together with uh, an integrated advice to our growers. Uh, I work as a global product manager at Coppert. And in my portfolio, I have several biological insecticides. So um, I want to discuss these further in my presentation. So on those biological insecticides, zooming into that group, there are uh, different biological insecticides on the market, and you probably all know some of them. So you can think of products based on azadiractina, um, other natural substances, some stickers. But there are, is also a large group um, based on fungi, so-called entomopathogenic fungi, or short as EPF. And in my presentation, I really want to zoom in into that specific group. So it's a difficult name, but what does it really mean? 
Uh, essentially, it's uh, a group of fungi that is able to kill pests. Uh, and they can kill a lot of different pests. So you can think of white flies, frips, aphids, but even things like uh, spider mites, flies, uh, and so on. So they can be a really powerful tool for a grower to control his pests in his greenhouse. Um, on the right hand side of this slide, you see some examples. So on the top, you see an aphid killed by, um, in this case, Lysenchilium. So you see it's turning brown, and in the end, it will also start to shrivel. So it's really uh, the effect you'll see after seven days. And in the picture below, you see a white fly killed by the same fungi, but then at high humidity conditions. And then the cool thing is you even see the growth of the mycelium and the sporulation on the outside of the insect. So what does it mean? This insect could potentially even reinfect new targets. Um, there are different products on the market. You might know them, but most of them are either based on Bouveria, Bouveria bassiana, products based on Isaria, also known as Pasilomyces, all difficult names. Products based on Metritium uh, and also uh, a product based on Lesionicillium or also known as Acanthomyces. Uh, like the product Mycotol, uh, Biscopert have in a lot of countries available uh, in horticulture. And more organisms might come uh, commercially available in the future. Um, before diving into those uh, fungi based products, why do we actually need them? There are uh, different drivers why <coughs> more and more of these type of products are used. Uh, like more restrictions on maximum residue levels, pest resistance. Uh, but one of the important drivers is also the amount of chemicals we have available on the market. And that's shown nicely in this graph. Yeah. Because here you can see the amount of chemicals registered, actives, I need to say, for, uh, registered in Europe from the beginning of this year, so 2023, all the way to the beginning of 2027. And you see what will happen in Europe over the next four years. You see. Uh, a really fast decrease and drop in the amount of uh, chemical actives, meaning we will have less products available for control of pests and diseases. On the other hand, you see a large portion are already biological actives, um, but you see the increase is not as rapid as we all would like it to be. And that's mainly because of registration hurdles and long timelines uh, in the registration. So this means actually that we need to get the most out of the products there are, uh, which are available in the market. First, maybe zooming in, how do these fungi-based products work? Um, you will see it on the right-hand side. It's the life cycle of those entom fungi. It's the example of Lysenicillium, but it's more or less the same for all the other type of um, uh, entom fungi. So what happens, the products are normally based on spores. So you spray your crop with your regular spraying equipment. You disperse the spores over the crop. And directly after you have sprayed those uh, spores, they start to germinate. And they actually produce a certain enzyme, which is weakening the, the cuticle, which is the skin of the insect. And by doing that, the, uh, the fungi is able to grow inside the uh, insect. And there it continues to grow. And by doing that, it's killing the uh, insect via different uh, modes of action. And as mentioned in the example of Lysenicillium, already in the beginning, at high humidity, you can have even outside sporulation. So potentially, the, uh, <coughs> the, uh, this external sporulation can reinfect new other and uh, other targets. So this is how it works. Um, and this is how it looks in practice at high humidity. So you see a white fly. It's still alive, but it's sprayed already with Lysenicillium. You see it's killed. And you also see the outside sporulation on the uh, outside of the insect. Um, so this is how it, how it looks in practice. Of course, at high humidity, at low humidity, you also see it's killed, but you will not see the outside sporulation. So how to integrate such products in your uh, IPM program with beneficials? One of the characteristics of these type of products is that they're uh, safe for almost all the beneficials and for the pollinators. Uh, and that's because they have a really specific mode of action uh, with the uh, specific enzymes, how they interact with your pests. And because of that, they are safe for a lot of different um, beneficials, almost all of them. Um, and I have shown an example on the right hand side. It's a screenshot of um, the corporate side effects app, where you see the example of one of the pathogenic and some pathogenic fungi, mycotol on um, mites, Swirsky. The Kelvin's Aphidilitis and also on the uh, <coughs> Bombus terrestris, so uh, uh, bumblebees. And you see indicated with the one, it's safe for the beneficials and it's also safe for the uh, pollinators. Furthermore, 
also they, there's no uh, pre-harvest interval, meaning that you as a grower you can use it all the way till the harvest. Um, so you don't need to wait as a grower or uh, maintain a certain amount of time between spraying and then harvest, uh, or the har pre-harvest interval is really short. And there are also no maximum residue levels for these type of products. So that are all characteristics that make them easy to integrate and to use them during your cultivation, even when there are best beneficials present in your crop. When to apply these type of products? You can distinguish mainly three uh, ways how these type of products are used. First of all, that's really at the start of the cultivation, so directly after planting. Uh, where in the, in the past you ha might have used um, chemicals to start off clean. Um, more and more growers start to do the same thing, so do a couple of applications with these type of products to start off clean. Uh, so to kill the overwintered uh, frips, aphids or other pests in your greenhouse or to, sh to kill the pests which might have come from the propagation phase. Secondly, also we see uh, the use as a correction tool. So when the, uh, the pest pressure starts to increase, the beneficials can cannot keep up with the pest, that these type of products are used to really bring down the pest pressure. And I have an example in this screenshot. It's a screenshot from a scouting app of Copper Natatech Scout, which is an example of a tomato grower where you see indicated with the blue line the uh, white fly pressure in the greenhouse. You see it starts to increase from week uh, 19 onwards. And then you see uh, that three applications are done with um <coughs> uh, an enzyme pathogenic fungi, uh, indicated with the arrows, and then afterwards you see the drop again. And there the beneficials are able to keep up again with the, uh, with the pest. Uh, and then the third way how the product is used is that more and more growers, especially in the ornamentals, are using uh, it in the regular spraying programs continuously. So every week, two weeks, three weeks, to continuously knock down the white fly frips or whatever uh, insect you might uh, want to target. And in that way, become a true counterpart of your beneficial. So part of your uh, controls coming from your beneficial insects you might, uh, or you uh, might have introduced in crop, and a part is coming down from the regular applications of the enzyme pathogenic fungi. And in that way, you can keep the pest pressure at a very low level, uh, or uh, even have a, a complete clean crop, which might be relevant for uh, exporting ornamentals, for example. How to apply these products? Um, there are different rules if uh, you want uh, to to uh, you want to look at if you want to apply these products effectively. The first one is you can apply these products via uh, regular spray, so with regular spraying equipment, but also via low volume misting systems. So really, the fogging systems you might uh, have in place in your greenhouse. Um, recently, we've done quite some research into this uh, at Coppert and. Um, it proves that you can apply these type of products really efficiently via these type of um, uh, application systems. Secondly, these products can be combined with a lot of uh, uh, chemicals, biologicals in the tank mix. Um, but some other uh, products might have uh, adversely uh, some effect on the, um, on the enzyme pathogenic fungi. So always please look at the advice from your supplier or advisor if you can really tank mix those products before you start to do so. Um, we should not forget that in the end these products are biological products, so um, the circumstances can make a big difference in how efficient they are in the field. So the advice is always to apply these products at the end of the day or alternatively early morning because then there's no radiation and the humidity is high, and fungi, they like high humidity. So ideally, the, the relative humidity is 60, 70 percent at the moment of application and uh, the couple of hours afterwards. And once the insect uh, of the fungus is grown inside the insect, the relative humidity becomes less, uh, less important. This is, I need to, to mention, this is the relative humidity in the canopy, so the microclimate, like shown in the, um, in the drawing. Uh, and if you have a, uh, a crop which is evaporating uh, in the right way, that's always as a the, the relative humidity is always 10, 20 percent higher than it is in the greenhouse itself. And then last, the best results are always obtained with such products when you do really um, uh, a couple of consecutive sprays, so two, three, or four, depending on the pest pressure. Uh, and the interval is also dependent on the pest. Like uh, with some pests, you might want to use an interval of seven days, but some other pests, you might want to have a shorter interval. 
uh, like for aphids, which are rapidly reproducing. So these are the four main um, rules. Of course, there was much more to say about this, but I don't have the time to do that. Um, this is what I wanted to tell. And if there are any questions, I think we can answer them now or later on. Yeah, thank you, Guido. And uh, yeah, I was glad to see the degrees of the chemical compounds. Was a little bit sad that I don't saw a degree uh, increase on biological alternatives. Indeed. As it uh, will be to you, then it will be a big uh, increase. But maybe with collaboration, we can assure that. Is there one question now to make something <coughs> that Guido told us to make some clear? And otherwise, yeah. Um, I don't have a handheld, but if you... Oh, there is a handheld. Oh. Thank you. Please, can you tell us our name and the question to Guido and from which organization you are, please? Yeah. I'm John Secker with Pure Flavor Hot House in Canada. Um, registration in other countries, it's registered in Europe. What about North America, Asia? Uh, I can say that it, the registration gives everywhere in the world her, uh, difficulties, but Europe is uh, amongst the, the strongest and the longest timeline. So America, Canada, all these countries, it's, 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 it's easier to register such products than it is in Europe. So is it registered? Uh, uh, the product is re uh, Mycotol is registered in uh, Canada, not in the US. Thank you. One more question, maybe? Okay, then we will uh, uh, wait to the end of the discussion. Thank you, Guido. And please, uh, Dick, um, also the floor to you. And please sh share us our day-to-day -day experience because you are going now into more practical cases. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, brief introduction. My name is Dick van Alphen. I work for Royal van Zenten, a uh, ornamental uh, breeding breeder. Uh, so we are really in the middle of the whole supply chain. We breed genetics, we breed beautiful plants, uh, but they are grown later on in, uh, in the cycle at, at professional growers. Um, and, yeah, and how do we deal with this, with integrated crop management? It's a, it is quite a challenge, but it's, it's a nice one, I have to say. Um, so we look at a, uh, a Royal Van Zanten uh, toolbox, what we, uh, what we have. As said, we are a breeding company, uh, so we can do something in the breeding area. Uh, healthy growing environment, it all hooks into the, to the earlier presentations. Uh, so th I'm happy to see that, by the way. Uh, best practices in hygiene is a good step. And teamwork. Um, I think it's fair to say that, that whatever you do, your basics need to be right. If, if your basic growing circumstances are not okay, you just have a lousy plant that's susceptible for, uh, for everything. Uh, so that's what we try to focus on on the day-to-day -day business. Um, so yeah, that combined uh, together with our partnerships is the toolbox to, uh, to success. If we look at our breeding uh, program, there are certain things we focus on. Uh, Soil-borne diseases are so really breeding at resistancy. Uh, Soil-borne diseases, insects, fungi, uh, virus and viroids. Uh, if, you, if you breed a variety that is resistant against trips, you have a lower risk of TSWV. Uh, if you have a variety that, that gives less issues with verticillium, uh, it, it, it helps the grower in the end as well. But it also helps us as, as cutting producers. So... Yeah, uh, the I'm speaking here for the middle, the production of plant material, and, and so we're really keen on finding those, uh, those benefits. Um, and what we see, it is a long-term long -term goal, long-term development, uh, and at this stage, if you just have one resistant variety, the rest of this isn't, and it's the same as with kids. If you don't have pancakes, you go for the fries or the or the pizza, so there's always something next to, uh, to, to eat off on, and that's yeah, what the diseases and pests will do as well. So we're not there yet, but it's step by step, just improving, and, and all our competitors do the same. It's just one of the things to move, uh, to move forward on. Um, and then if we look at our uh, production facilities, uh, we, we run a 23 hectare uh, cutting production unit in, uh, in East Africa. Um, and, and we really focus on an environment that just ensures healthy growth. And I just, I just highlighted three things here, uh, and th there's, there's more involved. Uh, but if you look at the climate, if you, have, if you have a healthy growing environment for your plants, uh, the light 
the, the right light intensity, uh, the right humidity, it just helps. It gives your plant uh, a, a good proper uh, growth. So we focus on that part and we make sure we have measuring equipment in place, read the data and, and move forward. Um, irrigation, to be mentioned earlier before as well. Uh, our plants need water, need uh, fertilizers to grow properly. And, and uh, the root system is a very delicate part of the, 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 the our, our plants. And if, if, if you mess up with the root system, all kinds of things will happen that you just don't want in your greenhouse. Uh, so really trying to understand our soil um, and uh, uh, measure what we, what we need to do and, and try to be, uh, to be spot on. And, and looking at a healthy soil. As you can see, a lot of it is still grown in, in the soil. And, and there are several <coughs> things you can do that help. Uh, one of the things we see, for example, nematodes is a, is a difficult one to, to, to kill with, uh, uh, with chemicals. It's not an easy one with biologicals, but there's a beautiful product called Marigolds that you can see it and, and really, uh, as a crop rotation product, uh, help you in your next crop cycle. So we're trying to integrate uh, different crops in our production cycle as well. Um, so, and it's all about finding the right balance in your growing environment, getting your basics right. Um, so that's, that's the growing part. If we look at the, the, the hygiene parts we mentioned before as well, really start clean, stay clean. Sounds very simple. Uh, it is simple, but you see that there's always some small, uh, small loopholes. So really practical things. Start with clean material. Um, or you can, you can treat the material that you get in. Uh, but you can also just make wise selections, which plant materials do we use as our starting material. Uh, and we always try to select the cleanest one out there so that we know that we import less issues and we can start off healthier. Uh, a simple other one, double door entries before you enter your greenhouse, just avoid, uh, yeah, avoid that trips is blowing in or that uh, acaros, uh, sorry, I've forgotten the English word for it, are, are, are moving in. It, it's, it's creating certain barriers and it's all small building blocks that help you in your uh, yeah, successful growing environment. Uh, you see the lo a lot of it is, is just being brought in by people. You wash your hands, uh, you wear an apron. So if you walk outside in the grass, you don't, you don't take any insects inside. Uh, just simple things like that. Um, so it's the outfit. And we really try to plant and empty greenhouses in one go. So you can also start clean, stay clean, and you'd know for sure you don't have any insects uh, wandering around before you uh, start your next crop. Um, so it's all about prevention. And then um, uh, the other one is uh, yeah, teamwork. Uh, really uh, developing a knowledgeable team is what, I, uh, what, I, what we call it. Um, and we focus on developing our team at, at the production sites. Uh, so not only in Uganda, Colombia, but also in the Netherlands, we try to connect our growers worldwide. Uh, because if, if you tap into each other's network, you, you, you learn and you find solutions. I'm a strong believer of that. So it's really at the production site. <coughs> sorry. So we invite our growers to, 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 to study, to participate in, uh, in, um, yeah, in, in partnerships. Um, but we also really work closely with competitors. So we work together with other production sites in Uganda because we all face the same challenges. And, and I think it's, you know, it's something pre-competitive. We all benefit from a clean sector. We all benefit from clean, clean produce. And, and I don't think that should be the unique reason to buy from, uh, from, from us. Uh, so we just want to make sure the market stays open and, and we produce wisely. So we really work together with our competitors uh, from that point of view as well. Uh, you're a relative small sector uh, in different parts of the world, so registering produce is difficult, getting in good results is difficult, uh, but there's also uh, uh, parts where you can work together by combining shipments, importing produce, and just having a, a, a decent cost price on, on that part as well. So 
yeah, finding each other. Um, well, partners, customers in the industry. So it's, it's uh, I mean, we work together with the Ver with corporate, with, with, with yeah, all the others uh, involved, but also with our, our customers. And in the end, we think, and I think, I strongly believe, that you have to work and, and, and work at this as a, as a team. And, and there's one clear message there, that's trust and transparency. If you, you have to be open uh, what you're experiencing, open what you've learned, and only that way you can uh, you can move the industry uh, forward. So that's a, a very brief, uh, but fast presentation. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, uh, Dick. And um, they were all very good, to my opinion, presentations. Is there a question in the audience about uh, what Dick is uh, presenting us? And when you have a question, please raise your hands or just yell, and then I come uh, to you. Um, maybe. Um, with this last, because I'm very for collaboration and working uh, together, I see teamwork. Is this my dream team? <laughs> because once when, we, when we want to improve uh, IPM, yeah, as you explained, we need knowledge, we need the biological, and we need the growers or the breeders who, who see the chances for us. Is this a dream team? Yeah, I, I think <laughs> you, you, at least as, as a researcher, we can think about thousand solutions but it's very nice to have people from the field that come to us and say this works but this is really like ut utopia maybe in 10 years then we really can go forward so that i think as research we always should look uh, further away but it's we should not like forget the real world and that's why we need each other uh, at least is how i looked at it <laughs> yeah, I cannot agree more. I mean, uh, we have quite some challenges ahead looking to the, the European goals, at least for 2030. So I think we need everybody on the table to at least reach those uh, goals. And uh, if you talk about really system developments, I think we should have all parties on the table to really make that change. So, And if you can also have the growers on board or even partners who work in the chain, I think we uh, yeah, we should collaborate, uh, and that's the only way towards success, in uh, my opinion. Yeah. So at this moment, the flower trials uh, are now here, and also at uh, Royal Fosante. So when the dream team is coming to you, Dick, what will we exceed in um, coming days? Well, I, I know for sure that um, in July, there's already work group starting in Uganda from the Wur, the suppliers, uh, and, and the different breeders uh, to understand each other's challenges and to find the way forward. So uh, yeah, it, you're talking about the dream team. It is already happening. And I think that's uh, yeah, it's just a positive sign. So collaboration is, yeah. is it can be a con an improvement uh, of this. Um, but you wanna, uh, when I listen well to your uh, presentation and I believe in innovations and new mm. systems, uh, but what you told about redesigning a cultivation system is, is maybe for people in the audience quite radical. Can you? Give some uh, ideas about how uh, how such a resilience uh, system can also be changing step by step. Yeah, I think I think it's possible to do small steps because that's of course the safe side. You don't can screw, screw screw up, but at the other side, sometimes some things don't work alone. So don't think that if you take one step, you suddenly don't need any pesticides anymore. That's just doesn't happen but it is not like that Man many times you need like three steps to really become like for a certain pest or disease you hardly have to use pesticides but but of course you not always can do the three things at once so just start one by one see whether it works and then go on but it also means that maybe if you take the first step you then not directly see that your pesticide use is like half of in the beginning but if it's not uh, going worse then take another one on top and then suddenly maybe you can see a, 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 a huge huge change that's what I think how it works okay yeah, yeah and that's come what I already said after your presentation Guido you see chemical compounds uh, decreasing not so much uh, biological compounds uh, so can you yeah, what you told about the fungi based products can be combined with other chemical of uh, biological products uh, in the tank mix uh, or with this step-by-step -step changing of the system um. You mean if they really can change uh, or replace the chemicals? 
yeah, or can we place it, or can we do it in combination? Because when it's ah. not 100% biological, biological, can we also yeah can be in between? So yeah, that's so, so there, they can be combined uh, quite well, I need to say, because most of those products, they, they are can even be combined in the same tank mix with a lot of chemical and biological insecticides and fungicides. However, there is always, there are of course some products uh, which are not uh, cannot be combined with this type of product. So, therefore, always it needs to be checked, and a really good advice needs to be given: what can be combined and what cannot be combined. So that that that's really something the supplier or the the independent advisor uh, will know, or can even be looked up on a lot of the uh, companies' websites. Yeah. So. When people want to know uh, more specific information, they can also visit your booth uh, of Coppertz uh, here uh, at the stage. Uh, more than welcome to answer questions. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Dick, um, there are a lot of people from abroad, to my opinion, what I see in the <coughs> audience. And um, can you tell me what are the challenges uh, for the use of biology abroad? Because what you, what you told also, uh, Roy van Zandt uh, is also a different uh, countries yep. in the world. So yep. what are the challenges? What what yeah, has the, uh, the people in the audience take home or take to uh, take into account? Um, I think that there are several challenges. One is uh, getting the logistics organized. A lot of the, the IPM products are uh, or the biological projects, uh, products are living organisms. Transporting living organisms worldwide is, is a challenge because you, you've got a supply chain that has to go by, by, by plane, by boat. Uh, what, so how efficient does your, uh, your product uh, remain at time of arrival? How do you apply it? Uh, that's one of the challenges. I think uh, understanding uh, of, of what each company does is a real important, uh, important one. So there's a, a, a bit technology, a lot, a lot can be solved nowadays. Uh, I mean, there's VR glasses that you can just uh, have your advisor yeah. uh, join you from behind his desk. Um, so, uh, but yeah, that's changing that mindset to adapt technology and, 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 and move forward. And it's that's, that's not always easy uh, uh, if you're a, uh, maybe a traditional grower like uh, like me, you know, I, I have yeah. to change as well. And that's so uh, don't, that's don't change one. the world by yourself or only by yourself, but also change the world by yeah. together with other yeah. experts. Yeah. Is there a question um, uh, from the audience about? Yes, please, ma'am. Uh, there is a mic, uh, she will come to you. Please, can you tell me who you are and who you address the question to? My name is huh? Is she on? Maybe it's working. Hello. Wha one, two, three. Ah, yeah, okay. it is. My name is Akmaral. I came from Kazakhstan. Uh, my question about the viruses. Um, can you please advise the best way how to protect uh, plants from the viruses? Because we using in our greenhouse the biological uh, for the insects, but um, our main uh, problem <laughs> in our greenhouses it's viruses. Yeah. Uh, for example, Tiberep, Tobago. Can you oh. can you give? An I can give an answer, <laughs> and maybe they yeah. can uh, <laughs> can add to that. But. Uh, there are, are so far not a lot of um, biological products against viruses. There are some, not a lot. It really depends on the crop. But I think the key word for viruses still now is hygiene. Uh, starting off with clean uh, planting material and really hygiene in, in the chain and also on, on your production side. That's what I want to say. And maybe Dick can add also from his experience to that. I think the other one is uh, uh, a eliminating the source. So if you have a, a virus source, you have to get it out of your greenhouse. And unfortunately, if, if your vector, for example, is trips and, 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 and your trips is infected and it will spread through your greenhouse, one way or another, you need to get rid of the trips because else you just keep that infection going. So it's, yeah, it, it is a combination of things. Uh, but if you want uh, to, uh, want to get some more details, don't hesitate to, uh, to ask later. Okay, thank, thank you yeah. for your question. Is there another question from the audience? Then I have another question uh, to um, uh, Johanna, because what I know is that growers, and okay, the Dick, maybe you can uh, better ask that, that for growers, quantity is very important. Quality of course of the product is also quantity of the product. Um, what about yield in a resilient cultivation system? Is it, com uh, is it possible in combination with high yield production? 
Yeah, I think in all the projects that we have, the aim is that, that the yield is not um, going down. But um, it's, it's many times also, uh, how to say that, um, it's really also, the, for example, the cultivar that you choose, of course, determines also uh, partly the yield and, of course, how good, well you can uh, yeah, treat your diseases and, and pests. And um, I think if you, if you add enough building blocks, then you can really fight the diseases and pests in most cases. And I agree that viruses are still the, <laughs> the hard thing. Uh, but, yeah, hygiene and also the water system can help already really a lot. Um, but then I think it's it's possible also in future. But but uh, yeah, also innovations at I think especially at the the breeding side will help with that a lot. Okay, yeah. thank you, uh, Johanna. Yeah. And I think as a dream team we can speak over this topic uh, even more minutes and hours. But we are mm -hmm. coming into time. I want to thank you, uh, Johanna, Guido, mm -hmm. and Dick, uh, for your time. Thank you for uh, as an audience. Uh, maybe people, when you have still some questions. Uh, you can ask uh, Johanna, you can visit uh, the corporate uh, booth here at the Green Tech, or I will recommend you go to the flyer trials at uh, Royal Fazanza. And thank you for your interest and a big applause for our experts.